Welcome back to Building Character, where we figure out how to play as your favorite fictional characters in Dungeons & Dragons. Join the Patreon for this character sheet and a whole bunch more, and like and subscribe for tastier food next time you play. Maybe. Today we're building Hector Barbosa, Captain of the Black Pearl, or at the very least, leader of its mutiny. We'll be reflavoring some stuff in this build, so first, rules as written was never part of my channel, so I don't have to do that. Secondly, you have to read all of the rules for the rules as written to apply, and you haven't. And third, the player's handbook is more what you'd call guidelines than actual rules. Welcome to building character, Miss Turner. Every time the moon shines, I become alive. Let's start off with our goals for this build. First, I guess we need to decide on which Barbosa we're going to be. Since he actually has more powers and abilities in the first movie than he does in the sequels, and because the first movie is my favorite movie of all time, we're going to do that Barbosa. So that means we need to not die and become virtually unkillable at the cost of some taste buds and skin. Next, we need to be an excellent swashbuckler, but not an actual swashbuckler because that requires a buckler, and not like a rogue, because Barbosa isn't very roguey. Yeah, rip that band-aid off early, we're not doing swashbuckler. Not every pirate is a swashbuckler, not every swashbuckler is a pirate. Finally, we need equal parts charming and terrifying, if only there was a stat for both of those things. For stats, we'll be using the standard point array from the player's handbook. Or for stats, if you want, just keep your multi-classing minimums in mind. We're going to start off with charisma, because your equal parts charming and terrifying, that's the stat for both of those things. Dexterity next, a cutlass, should be called a stab more, because that's what you use it for. Constitution after that, dying isn't something you do, unless there's some breaking of curses, and hey, that's your goal, so you win no matter what. Follow that up with wisdom, sailing requires some perception, and Jack likes you, the monkey Jack, not the sparrow. Intelligence is a bit low, you don't really understand the curse stuff until it's too late, and we'll dump strength. I feel like the reason you're trying to end the curse is because you're worried about getting trapped under a beam for all of eternity after a shipwreck. Immortality makes being pinned somewhere an inevitability, and cell phones didn't exist yet. Barbosa is a human, but a funky human who can't die because of cursed treasure, so we're gonna go custom lineage. We're not going reborn, because technically he doesn't die and come back until the second one, and we're, we're this is mostly the first one. Bump your dexterity with your two free points, for better fencing and take the skill expert feat for intimidation, expertise in intimidation to double the proficiency bonus, and round up your charisma for even more intimidation. You're a really scary dude. Grab Arcana for your skill of choice because we need it to understand all that pirate lore, and grab the pirate background because, well, he's a pirate. That'll give you athletics and perception proficiency. You might not be able to feel the warmth of the sun anymore, but you can point your ship at it. We're gonna kick things off as a fighter, and if that's unpopular, boy howdy, strap yourselves in. Grab history and animal handling for your skills of choice to know all about parlay and to chill with your monkey friend. You also get a fighting style like dueling to add two to the damage of a weapon you're wielding one-handed to really shish kebab rival pirates. You also get second wind letting you recover 1d10 plus your fighter level in HP as a bonus action once per short rest. For most fighters, this is taking a deep breath, but for you, it's muscle fibers sewing back together. Just because Barbosa can't taste flavor, that doesn't mean his build shouldn't have any flavor, you know? Second level fighters get action surge, letting you make two actions in one turn once per short rest. If you can't swing your sword fast, you'll be dead. Well, you won't, but the other pirates will be. Third level fighters can choose a martial archetype and the undead pirate archetype type lets you choose an extra proficiency from a short list like insight to figure out if people are lying about their relationship to bootstrap bill you also get a fighting spirit letting you use a bonus action to give yourself advantage on weapon attacks until the end of your next turn and give yourself five temporary hp you can use it three times per long rest basically giving you 15 more hp at this level but it's temporary unofficial hp like skeletal monster man hp you know now that we have these abilities that are in character it's time to reveal that i lied to you about the name of this archetype it's not undead pirate it's samurai which you you saw it in the graphic. Mm, Tulak made a pirate a samurai instead of a swashbuckler? Well, I sure do disagree, but we'll be reasonable and wait for him to give a decent explanation. I hear you typing, so let's talk about it. Samurai fighters get temporary HP and bonuses to their charisma and saving throws. There's no part of the subclass that says you have to be from Japan. Japan doesn't exist in 5e. A samurai is described as a fighter with a larger amount of resolve, and I'd say undead pirates have that. Contrast that with swashbuckler, which at this level would get a good method of running away, an ability to use sneak attack in a one-on-one -on -one duel, the latter ability could be nice for Barbosa, but he doesn't really use cheap shots, he's kind of just good at fighting, and is definitely more likely to attack Jack than bait him into a chase. Basically, Barbosa is Yosemite Sam, and Jack Sparrow is Bugs Bunny. Trust me, your character building time will be so much more fun when you stop thinking of subclasses as their most basic stereotype, and instead think about what the abilities could do for the character you're trying to create. Or just unsubscribe because the D&D YouTube man made a pirate a samurai, I don't really care. Fourth level pirate samurais get an ability score improvement. Dexterity will make you a better swashbuckler. I was nervous about 
about putting that joke in, but I realized anyone who was upset by it has already sailed on to friendlier seas. Fifth level fighters get an extra attack, letting you attack twice with your action instead of once and up to four times with your action surge. I've heard of chicken kebab, but sparrow kebab could be pretty good. Probably pretty gamey, most small birds are, and actually there wouldn't be a lot of meat on it. And stick with chicken. One more quick level fighter for an ability score improvement to let us cap off our dexterity before we move on to truly cursed territory and become the most fearsome pirate on the seven seas. Well, as fearsome as we can be with skin. But if we want to ditch the skin for a big win, undead warlocks are uncomfortably thin. You get Form of Dread, giving you 1d10 plus your warlock level and temporary HP, the ability to force a wisdom saving throw on a creature you hit with an attack, frightening them for a round if they fail, and you're immune to frightening. All that lasts for a minute and you can use it an amount of times per day equal to your proficiency bonus to make sure you've always got some temporary HP. For cantrips, Eldritch Blast is good, but True Strike is better to help you get your sneak attack on from Swashbuckler. Crusty Digitation lets you do a bunch of small close-up magic, lighting candles, making little trinkets. It's just cool flavor stuff that can't do damage, but it's generally fun. Undead Warlocks can learn False Light, giving you 1d4 plus 4 temporary HP for up to an hour, no concentration required. If your Undead Pirate subclass abilities run out, this is how you can still have an unnatural amount of HP. Also worth noting, temporary HP doesn't stack, it just refreshes, so you can't mix these together. Cause Fear forces a Wisdom saving throw on a creature, failing that, you're frightened for up to a minute, depending on your concentration, you best start believing in frightening builds, Miss Turner. You're in one! Second level Warlocks get invocations, special perks packages, courtesy of those cursed coins you stole. Hard sense to say. Fiendish Vigor is another way to cast False Life, now casting it at will as much as you want with no spell slots required, but only at the first level. So if you want to use your higher level Warlock slots you get later, it'll still have to be the one you grab from that list. Obligatory, I'm gonna say, don't use a higher level slot on False Life, it doesn't scale well. Beguiling Influence gives you Deception and Persuasion proficiency, so you can explain that being disinclined to acquiesce to your request is actually just a fancy way of saying no. Third level Warlocks get a pack of boom little gifts from your benefactor, or I guess in your case, cursed gold. We'll go for a pack to the blade for a magical weapon you can always conjure. I like the idea of you storing it in your own chest and pulling it out when someone needs a good stabbing. Pack to the talisman from Tasha's would also be fine mechanically, it just doesn't work like the treasure does, so I'm not counting it as treasure. Also, pack to the chain doesn't let you get monkey familiars. I'm not calling it an imp a monkey because imps aren't monkeys. There's a difference between reflavoring and homebrew, and the difference is mechanics. If you don't change a mechanic, that's flavor. If you ask for something that isn't in the book, it's homebrew. For this level spell, enthrall helps get all eyes on you, forcing a wisdom saving throw on creatures that can hear you. On a failed save, creatures have disadvantage perceiving anyone who isn't you for a minute, no concentration required. Post-redemption arc, you tend to draw some fire for the more roguish members of the party to sneak about unseen, because you're not a rogue. Four level warlocks get another ability score improvement, let's get that charisma up to be a scarier guy with harder to resist fear effects. You could also become more charming by scooping up the first level spell, Charm Person, which forces a wisdom saving throw on creatures, failing that they're charmed by you for an hour. I'm not really that interested in the movies beyond three, but Barbosa is a politician, I think, and he has a daughter. He's still charming and the movie isn't bad, but, but yeah, just use this if you don't want to be a bad guy. Fifth level warlocks get third level spells. Summon Undead comes from Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, which summons an undead spirit to aid you. You get to choose if it's a ghost, putrid, or skeleton. Skeletons would fit your crew. The stats are in Tasha's, but it can shoot things or draw fire for you, as long as you keep your concentration up for an hour. Hopefully, they're more confident than your assistance in the movie. You also get another invocation. Gift of the Depths gives you a swimming speed and the ability to breathe underwater, as well as the ability to cast water breathing once per long rest for free, which would give 10 allies the ability to breathe underwater. Share the treasure, and everyone gets as cursed as you. Wonderful. Six of the undead warlocks are grave touched, meaning that you don't need to eat, drink, breathe, and you can replace your damage with necrotic damage, as well as add an extra damage die when you deal necrotic damage when your form of dread is activated once per round. That means that your rapier can deal 2d8 plus 7 necrotic damage in one stab, which is pretty nasty. Maybe you should wash it every once in a while, though. Seventh level warlocks get fourth level spells. Death Ward gives a creature immunity to death the first time it should die in the next eight hours, instead dropping to one HP. Cast it on yourself, then use one of your many ways to get temporary HP to get back into the swing of things, fight with another immortal, locked in an epic battle till judgment day, and trumpet sound. Honestly, I might just surrender. You also get one last invocation, improved packed weapon, adds one to the attack and damage rolls with your packed weapon, making you more accurate and deal even more damage with each stab of your sword. A level warlocks get another ability score improvement to cap off your charisma modifier. Now, nobody can resist the sheer terror of the Black Pearl's flag on the horizon. Back over to fighter now, seventh level samurais get elegant courtiers, letting you add your wisdom modifier to your persuasion checks, and you have proficiency with wisdom saving throws. Funnily enough, rogues also get wisdom save proficiency at level 14, but that's all it gives them. This comes earlier and has a small benefit of making you slightly more charming. 
it's quite nice in double fighters get another ability score improvement let's grab that defensive duelist feat letting you add your proficiency bonus to your ac as a reaction against one attack per round you might be almost fully immune to being stabbed but there's no reason to take a hit if you don't have to Ninth level fighters get indomitable letting you re-roll a failed saving throw once per long rest you can even apply these to death saving throws which would be a very in character move for an immortal but it's probably not as good as just making sure you jump away from the fireball 10th level samurai get tireless spirit meaning that if you roll initiative with no uses of fighting spirit you get one back and the temporary hp jumps up to 10 instead of 5. you could also pair the advantage with your extra attack damage from form of dread which would be a 4d8 critical hit twice as often very fun 11th level fighters get another extra attack which will let you make three attacks with your action instead of one or six attacks with your action surge pop a fighting spirit and you'll have advantage on all of those attack rolls that means you've got 12 die to roll to get a critical hit i believe in you our capstone is the 12th level fighter and while you have plenty of methods to get more temporary hp your actual hp is looking a little low so grab the tough feet for 40 more hp and get that real immortal feeling going now that we've hit level 20 let's figure out how viable this build is first you're dealing nice and consistent damage with three attacks per round and a capped off modifier with an extra capped off modifier thanks to improved packed weapon and dueling you're also a pretty solid tank with over 150 hp and ways to get temporary hp to keep people from actually hitting your real stuff finally you've got 10 skills and capped off charisma modifier to be a handsome and horrifying face when you need to be for weaknesses temporary hp doesn't stack meaning the best you're going to be able to get in a single turn is 1d4 plus 19 from a fourth level false life which isn't a great use of your spell slots speaking of two spell slots per short rest is bad especially considering i wouldn't call the spells we took the best ones on the warlock list finally you're abilities are dependent on fear there's lots of high level creatures that are just totally immune to the condition but if they're not afraid of you just stab them until they realize they should be keep yourself alive long enough to break the curse just remember that breaking the curse also means you die weird goal my dude thanks for watching if you like the video subscribe for more we make two videos every week join the patreon for this character sheet and a whole bunch more and sub to two lock and mango for more two lock fun